Hi, everyone, and welcome to the American Indian Community House COVID Fireside Chat Series. My name is Keely Redditch, and I'll be hosting this evening's panel. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to the American Indian Community House and this series moving forward. The American Indian Community House, AICH, is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization serving the needs of Native Americans residing in New York City. The mission of AICH is to improve and promote the well-being of the American Indian community and to increase the visibility of American Indian cultures in an urban setting to cultivate awareness, understanding, and respect. We are focused on strengths rather than weaknesses, such as connection, prevention, traditions, culture, community, unity, and care. AICH was founded in 1969 by Native American volunteers as a community-based organization mandated to improve the status of Native Americans and to foster cultural understanding. AICH membership is currently composed of Native Americans from 72 tribes and continually conducts outreach to further engage the Native community in NYC. While AICH's focus is the intersectionality, diverse tribal affiliation, multiraciality, gender, sexuality, economics, age, disability, religion, and spiritu spirituality, urban native population of New York City, we recognize the interrelatedness of all Native Americans due to migration between urban centers and reservations. And we maintain strong connections with the reservation communities in recognition of our shared issues and concerns. So a little bit about this specific panel. So this, this is part one of a four part series, which will be discussing the um, COVID impact, impacts on local native communities with a focus on the Northeastern communities. Um, this evening's panel is um, insights from native physicians and researchers. Uh, part two will be a conversation with native community leaders to discuss community needs and available resources. Part three will be stories of strength and resilience from AICH community members. And part four will be a discussion with the next generation of native physicians and researchers. So for this evening's um, introductions, I wanted to turn it over to our panelists to give them space to introduce themselves as they uh, wish to do so. So we'll start with Dr. Stephanie Gilson. Thank you. Han um, um my name is Stephanie Gilson. I'm Dakota Midwakatan Sioux, uh, originally from um, uh, what is called uh, Minnesota. Um, I am out here on the East Coast. I am um, went to medical school in, in Minnesota, but I'm finishing up my residency in um, psychiatry. And um, throughout this COVID pandemic, have um, done everything from working on our inpatient COVID wards to um, helping support um, Native communities in the Midwest with um, thinking about holistic ways to support them during this time. Excited to be here with you all. Uh, Dr. Horn. Um, my name is Ojisto Gunawaherde Horn. I am, uh, my father is from Akwazasne up in Northern New York state. And my mother is from uh, Kahnawage, which is another Ganyakehaga uh, uh, um, community in Canada. I am a physician working uh, right now in Akwazasne and um, I'm a family doctor and uh, I carry a lot of hats in the community. Um, and uh, the past year has been very, very busy and very, um, very uh, challenging. I'm really happy to be here today to share some of those, uh, some of those stories. Thank you. Great. Dr. Mertens. Hi, um, my name is Max. I grew up in Utah and I am Navajo. And I went to university in Utah and the of U University of Utah. And then I received my PhD in specifically virology from Harvard University. Um, I didn't study um, the COVID-19 virus specifically, but there was a lot of that going around campus with discussions about vaccines and things like that. So hopefully we can have a good discussion about that because there's a lot of um, can, can, um, confusion going around about things. So I hope we can have a, a good discussion about that. And Dr. Thompson. My name is Brian Thompson, uh, Nida uh, from here in New York. My mom is Nida. Uh, my dad is from Akwesasne. And uh, I work uh, in Syracuse, New York at Upstate Medical University. I'm an OBGYN. 
and it's a great pleasure to be on this panel and to uh, see uh, one of my good friends. And, uh, and Max Yate, my wife is uh, Danae, and, uh, and uh, she sends out her greetings also. Thank you. It's so great to have all of you here. So um, the panel, the way we're going to format this is we'll ask, um, we'll put the question on the screen and then we'll allow our panelists to answer the questions as they um, would like. And um, then I know we have some, some more in deta detailed explanations that will be given. So we're going to proceed um, with the questions going forward. And then I'll ask the question and the panelists can address them. So we want to begin this discussion by just basically explaining what is COVID. So if anyone would like to, I know Dr. Burton submitted these slides, um, but you know, feel free to add in your piece. Yeah. So um, so COVID COVID nineteen is actually an acronym. So COVID nineteen stands for um, what's underlined there is coronavirus disease. And the 19 is 2019. Um, so COVID-19 is the name of the disease that is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. And SARS-CoV-2 is actually a member of a very large family of coronaviruses that infect a wide variety of mammals and non-mammals. And um, this virus was first isolated in Wuhan, China in late 2019. So um, actually on the screen, these pictures are pictures um, actually of the virus when they isolated it. It's not that color, it was artificially colored for the image. But um, the word corona actually comes from the word for crown, which is what the scientists kind of thought it looked like, those spikes along the surface you can see on the outside of the virus. And when we discuss vaccines um, and things like that, um, we use the word spike a lot because that's the name for those little protrusions you see around the outside of the virus in the green, which is a target for a lot of the vaccine. So um, when people say COVID, that's the disease caused by the virus. Great. Um, so does, any, does anyone else have any additions they'd like to give to that explanation? That was a great explanation. Thank you so much. So I wish I could uh, mention what the word was. One of our elders um, in uh, in Okwazasne, um gave uh, the COVID uh, virus a um, a name, and um, I have it here. Um, just give me one second. Um, and she gave it the name very early on because when something is unseen and um, and um, and you need to put your minds together to come up with a way of uh, dealing with it, you have to name it. So Ganraze Ganratarines, the new walking disease that we and um, and we don't belong to you. It doesn't belong to us and it's walking, it's going through us and it's um, just changing as it goes along. And so she um, she gave it the name and um, it's what um, has been used um, in different circles, particularly in our community. Great, thank you. I'm going to go on to our next question that we have. Um, so I'm sure this is on a lot of people's minds. And I think the information for this question actually uh, changed slightly today with some news that was released. Um, so what are the differences between the currently available COVID vaccines and those that are soon to be released? So the Johnson & Johnson and the um, AstraZeneca. And I know Dr. Mertens prepared a few slides for this to explain them um, and then um, we also have to take into account the update that was just released today from the FDA. So um, there are a bunch of different vaccines that have been um, kind of developed to um, fight this virus. So um, a vaccine essentially is um, when you are given a very small piece of the virus or something that helps train your immune system without giving you a disease or anything. And what it does is it trains your immune system. So if you encounter, in this case, the COVID-19 virus in the future, you'll be protected from developing disease. So um, the four main um, 
vaccines that are have been talked about a lot in the news and everything were developed by Moderna, um, Pfizer. It was that was in partnership with a company called BioNTech, um, Johnson and Johnson, and from another company called AstraZeneca. That one was also developed um, with the University of Oxford. So a lot of in the in the news people were referred to that as the Oxford vaccine, which was developed, which was um, developed helped develop with um, AstraZeneca. So of the four vaccines that are um, either approved or going through the approval process with the news today about Johnson & Johnson. Um, they fall usually into um, two different, what they call platforms, two, the Moderna and Pfizer are um, mRNA vaccines. Um, and then the other two from Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca are viral vector vaccines. So I can, I'll explain what each of those are but they are both different ways of getting to the same endpoint, which is um, teaching your immune system how to be able to protect you against the COVID-19 virus in the event that you become exposed to it and infected by it in the future. So the first two are Moderna and Pfizer, which are mRNA vaccines. So they have been approved for what's called emergency use authorization by the Food and Drug Administration. So um, these um, vaccines, even though they are under emergency use, they have gone through extensive development and testing for that. And um, they are, are probably the, the best readout that um, they give when they conduct their clinical trials is what they call efficacy. So efficacy is, um, is essentially a percent measurement of how good their vaccine is at preventing um, that preventing COVID-19 within their study population. In this case, the Moderna and Pfizer were 94 and 95 percent efficacious at preventing disease, which is incredible for a vaccine, really. That's very, very high. Um, and then the number of doses for these is two doses, either 28 either four weeks or three weeks apart. Um, and so then uh, for um, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, they are viral vector vaccines, as I mentioned, and their efficacy seems to be a little bit lower. Um, these are using more traditional method or traditional, um, I guess we'll say platforms of what vaccines we have currently. Um, so they, yeah, they are a little bit, so yeah. So what I'll talk about is the mRNA vaccine. So this is um, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. So this is a this is a new a newer technology. This is the kind of the first generation of these vaccines or this type, this mRNA vaccine. But it's been in develop with in development companies for at least like ten years or something. It's just kind of the first time that they've really um, ran a clinical trial with them. So. With an mRNA vaccine, so essentially what this is, is this vaccine, it gives a chemical message to your cells to produce that spike protein that I mentioned that's on the outside of the virus. Um, they're normally found on the outside of the virus. And what, you, what happens is your cells actually make this spike protein using that chemical message. And they take these those spike proteins and they present them to the immune system and the immune system recognizes them and generates an immune response. Um, and in this case, though, they make what's called antibodies that help protect you that can bond. So these um, antibodies that recognize the spike that your cells make will also recognize the spike on the outside of the actual virus if you encountered it in the future. And then these antibodies are then ready to protect you in, um, in case you are infected with the actual virus in the future. So probably the main um, question that most people have about not just um, this vaccine, but um, essentially all vaccines is do they cause the disease? And for mRNA vaccines, they do not cause COVID-19 because this, is, uh, this mRNA in the vaccine is a message for only a very, very small piece of the virus, that spike piece, not the entire virus. So then the other types of vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca are what are called viral vector vaccines. And so these are actually um, genetically modified viruses that are, that are safe 
and do not the, and do not replicate in your body, which makes them safe, but they still protect you from um, future infection. And also these vectors also, they do not cause COVID-19 because they don't replicate. And they all also only contain that very small portion for the spike like the mRNA vaccines do. So how um, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they're, the platforms of these vaccines are actually very similar, but they're based on the same idea. So what they did is they took what's called an adenovirus, which is a very, very common virus that essentially everyone has been exposed to um, in their life. And they cause just mild cold-like symptoms usually. So what they did for this adenovirus is that they removed some of the gen genetic material from the virus that makes it safe. And then they added a very, the very small sequence for the spike protein from the COVID-19 virus. And so what this does is then when you introduce this virus, um, it will um, go into your cells and actually instruct your cells to make the spike protein in a, in, um, a manner that's very, very similar to what the mRNA vaccines do. So then what you get um, is you have a modified adenovirus that is safe because it doesn't replicate um, or cause disease and it gives you protection against COVID-19. I think, you know, um, sometimes uh, when I talk to patients about what they want to know in terms of these vaccines, especially, you know, for me uh, dealing with, with, with patients who are pregnant, is, you know, is, um, you know, what exactly this vaccine is? Does it, you know, for our people, you know, are, are we getting uh, injected with, with that virus? Uh, is it going to mess up my, my, uh, my genetic material? Is it, gonna, is it gonna hurt me in any type of way? And, and uh, what's really interesting is about the, the one that Max was talking about, the, the messenger RNA, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, is that the, it, there's actually not virus in there. It's, it's a message uh, that's contained in this little fat like a, like a, almost looks like a tic tac, uh, uh, like a little fat bubble that that, that goes uh, and connects to your to your cell or the building blocks of your body, actually into your muscle where you get the shot, uh, and it and it it doesn't actually go in and connect to your your genetic material or, or change it in any way, uh, it, but it does tell your body to to make this this uh, thing called a protein. Um, uh, and if you look on, on the slide, it's those little spiky things. And, and it tells you to make a, a little bit of that so that your body can, can see that and try to fight it off. So when you get vaccinated, you, you get a lot of these different symptoms uh, that I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, and, it, and it's your body you know, fighting off uh, what's, uh, what's what, uh, um, uh, a little portion of, of, of that virus itself. Um, the, the other one, the, the, the Johnson & Johnson, which uh, uh, we'll get a, probably uh, approved, I'm sure will, will get approved on Friday, works in a little bit of a different way. Um, but uh, uh, it, 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 instead of being kind of in this little fat bubble, it's in a cold virus. Uh, but does but is only like the the structure of it, kind of like a like a car without any innards or anything at all. Uh, so it, it can't really run or move or anything like that. And and because cold viruses can really get in and attack our body, uh, uh, they've used this kind of structure to to help with their vaccine. But it doesn't actually contain like the cold virus itself. So it's just a different way of doing it. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a great explanation. Um, I had a, a friend who even her way of explaining it was she described the mRNA vaccine as a, a Snapchat message <laughs> for your cells. So it just kind of like appears and shows what your body needs to make and fight against and then it disappears in a way. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting analogy that was given as well. Um, what's interesting too is like with the with with the 
uh, the mRNA of the Pfizer and Moderna, that, that actual part that's, that, that's put in, the vaccine that you get, it actually breaks down, your body actually breaks it down and digests it and gets rid of it in about two to three hours. Uh, so it just, it forms these little proteins and then it, it dissolves. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it, it, it really is uh, um, uh, quite remarkable that they were able to, to, to generate in this fashion, although these type of vaccines have been made in this fashion for, for a number of years. Yeah, so that was going to be my question kind of um, going off of that was, you know, our have this mRNA vaccine technology is new, but it's not that new in theory. My understanding from scientific readings is that it's been around for a while. It just hadn't made it quite yet to the clinical trial stage. And this was the first time where it was kind of spotlight was shown on it because of this pandemic that we're currently in. So can anyone speak to that, you know, that they know that this has been around for a while, so it's not as new as people think, so there's maybe not as need to fear it as much? And I think, I mean, companies invest a lot of money to make their products safe, especially something like a vaccine that will be distributed to a wide number of people. So I believe um, these, I mean, these companies have been working on it for at least 10 years. So when you start the platform, you'll work on it and you realize, oh, okay, well, that part didn't work. So we're going to change it. And it's gone through many, many different um, trials and iterations to find it the, um, uh, the, find, I guess, the best way it'll work while maintaining the maximum amount of safety that they can, um, which I guess it's, they've kind of shown that they have done a pretty thorough and rigorous job as they're getting 94 and 95% efficacy for kind of a first generation vaccine like this, but it, they have definitely put in their um, time to make sure that they're getting the kind of the best product out there. So I just wanted to um, just jump in and just uh, talk about not all everybody um, can really understand all of the um, all of the medical and scientific jargon that we've been talking about. My mom is 81 years old and uh, very, very much against the vaccines. And she didn't really understand the immune system or what these vaccines are or anything like that. So what I was telling her was like, hey man, a long time ago, if we sent scouts out to go and look and, and to keep our community safe, you would know what type of you know, natives were out there who were your enemies or who were your friends based on their tattoos or the way they held their feathers or their clothing. There was something that distinguished them as being, you know, really good or not so good. And so um, what these are is what we're doing is sending our scouts out to um, look at the terrain. We're always looking around. And what we're doing is saying here, when you see somebody who's dressed like this, bad. And so then when the scouts out there sees that person dressed like that, runs back and says, okay, everybody get ready. These people are coming. And so when I described it like that, like it's just a, a way of your body recognizing something earlier than it otherwise would to protect you, then she understood it better. Yeah, that's, that's a great explanation. I think that it's really important that we take these ideas and make them so that way everyone can understand them. Yeah, and just kind of echoing off what Dr. Horn was saying that I'm hearing a lot of that too, or people, there's, I think just a lot of not... Um, understanding of the science. And I think uh, there's, you know, historically a lot of mistrust with the medical community for our communities, um, which is rightfully earned. Um, and I think, yeah, using some sort of, and now, you know, talking to, you know, I, that's a, a great one, Dr. Horn. Yeah. I sometimes talk about like having our arm, like a, having like an army reserve or something like that, you know, they're similar, they're always prepped. Um, and I've also seen a lot of people being kind of hesitant about, well, it's not hundred, you know, it's not hundred percent like this Johnson and Johnson one. Um, but what we know is it really helps that not having experienced such a high disease because you have these armies that are ready to kind of like fight, fight off the virus where you still might get maybe sick, but not as sick where you would need to go to the hospital or need a breathing tube or, um, so that's, I think also important to talk about. No, I agree. Um, and I think my next question was going to be will the coronavirus vaccine give me coronavirus? 
Um, Cause I think that that's also a concern that a lot of people have. We talked about, you know, what is gonna happen to our bodies if we are given the vaccine? Um, you know, does it change us in any way? So I think, you know, we kind of touched on that. I am, if you guys wanted to maybe elaborate on those points and just, you know, reaffirm, you know, I'm sure several of you on this panel have received the vaccine yourself. Um, so maybe you could, you know, explain, you know, why you chose to go ahead and take it um, or something to that degree, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. So as, um, so I'm one of the uh, only primary care um, practitioners in our community. And um, during the uh, during this um, crisis, this uh, pandemic, my goal has not been to just continue to see anybody who you know wants to be seen, but trying to identify those people who need to be seen continuously, like pregnant ladies, babies, and those people who've been discharged from hospital. They're at home. They're very you know have a number of comorbid or other conditions that make them very fragile. And so, and of course, our long-term care um, 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 people, uh, community members who are in long-term care homes, and so, um, and so, I had to go through all these different parts of the community, and I recognized that if I don't, um, even though at the, I initially was very hesitant to um, to get vaccinated because of all of the reasons that we have described and some others, um, I um, I recognized that because I'm going into all of these spaces, even though I'm wearing PPE, I would never ever want to be a super spreader event and go all the way through the community seeing all the most vulnerable people in the community and you know make a lot of people sick so um, I felt like it was a responsibility that I had to um, protect um, my patients my community um, um, people and so um, so that's why I did the vaccine and the very first uh, one was very unremarkable um, but I'll have to say the second one I actually thought I had a coronavirus, I had so many symptoms and I thought, oh my goodness, maybe I got it at the same time. However, I know that by getting all of these symptoms, it means my body is mounting an incredibly strong response. And I also know because I did the swab at the same time as I got the shot and it came back negative. So I know that I did not have coronavirus, but it did go through my mind because I felt so terrible. And so I know um, in some people, if they create a response like that, their body may not be strong or robust or resilient enough to be able to withstand all of the inflammation that they may be feeling. So then they get sick. And so you'll hear a lot of people who will say, oh, I got that flu vaccine and I was never so sick as when I got that, I will never get that again. But actually what was happening is they were mounting a really good response or they got another response, another um, another virus at the same time, um, and that there it and, and so we never really know what happened. In my case, I do know because I got the vaccine and the um, and the swab at the same time but I got sick and it's true. Some people will think that we give them the coronavirus, but what we're actually doing is we are mounting a strong response. We're making an army for this virus when we really do see it. Yeah, because the um, vaccines that are um, being administered are only um, a message for a very, very small part of the virus. There's not, there's not the full virus there, so. Um, that, that's why you're getting the response. I, I, would, I would also say that too, you know, that the vaccine itself won't give you coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, because it, it doesn't actually contain the virus itself. It, it, it um, uh, you know, you, you, when you get the vaccine, you get, just like uh, Dr. Warren was talking about, you get, Sometimes the symptoms uh, of any type of, 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 of virus, like a cold, you know, like a cold or flu or anything like that, where you can get a headache or, or achy joints or that kind of fatigued or rundown feeling itself. I, I, I've gotten both of my vaccines. I, I, I agree that the, the second one is a little bit tougher than the first. I, I was tired after my second one and had some joint aches. Um, but it's a lot better than the alternative, and and you know, and I think when you when you when you really look at our communities, it, 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 and I and I know this intimately from my my uh, my wife Matilda being Danae, 
and the devastation that's occurred out in that community. Uh, we've actually fared better in, in total in, in, in Haudenosaunee, but, but, uh, but there's been areas that have been devastated. And, and to lose you know, one of our people is like losing a library. It's like you, know, you, you, you lose just an incredible vast amount of, of knowledge and so they, they actually kind of looked at this a little bit, the, the, the um, Urban Indian Health Institute about a month ago um, uh, did a survey uh, of natives across Turtle Island. They, they, they said, you know, why, you know, would you get the vaccine or why wouldn't you get the vaccine? Uh, and, they, and they actually found that for our people, uh, about 75% would get vaccinated, which is higher than you know, other, other races. And, and, and the reason for it is what we've all talked about already is that it, there's, you know, we don't wanna be a super spreader. We don't wanna give this to one of our elders or our family members. We're doing this for the love of our community. We're doing it out of a sense of, 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 of saving our, our, our culture, our ceremonies, our songs, our dances. Uh, and, and all of those reasons. So, uh, you know, for, for our people, a lot of it is, is not so much about protecting yourself. It's about protecting everybody else around you. And, and so when they looked at that, they found that there's actually a, you know, a higher rate of, of our people that, that are willing to take the vaccine. But the ones that don't take the vaccine, about 90% of them, felt that COVID-19 was, was a serious thing, that it was a real thing. There's a lot of misinformation out there uh, you know, that, that certainly we can talk about uh, and it needs to be talked about. Uh, but um, but I've, I've found that within uh, our communities around Syracuse that, that our elders and our vulnerable have been incredibly willing to take the vaccine uh, and, and to see them take the vaccine, uh, people that I grew up with, people that I know, people that babysat me when I was a kid, uh, to see their smile. And, and, and uh, because the, the vaccine itself, when you get it, 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 it once you develop that 94, 95%, what, what we've been medically calling effectiveness, it, it really, what it really means is that that your chances of, of being, if, you, if you're that four or 5% that get it, that you won't be in the ICU, you won't uh, be that, that sick. The, the patients who, who get COVID after they get the vaccine will either not develop symptoms or mild symptoms or moderate symptoms. And that's why it's so important even after you get the vaccine that, that you still have to wash your hands that you still have to wear a mask, you know, that, that uh, because of some of our communities have outbreaks of spread of the virus that, that you know, you should still kind of socially distance. Uh, all of those things are still in place. Uh, but um, but that, that sense of, of, of community that we all have to our people, uh, to the faces yet to come, uh, are always our first and foremost. And that's why I think most of the people that I've come in contact with have been willing to take the vaccine. But at the same time, I also respect and non-judgmental to the people that don't. You know, if you don't want to do it, that's okay. I understand that. Uh, but I do think that, that uh, it's important for the reasons that we talked about. No, thank you all. I really appreciate that. I think that's some wonderful insight, um, especially to your own communities and just your own experiences. Um, so we've been talking about the vaccine and, you know, we've established you will not get coronavirus if you receive the vaccine, but everyone on the panel has mentioned their side effects or <laughs> several of you mentioned your side effects. So, you know, when you receive the vaccine, you said it feels like coronavirus. So can you just maybe walk us through some of these side effects that you guys have had after receiving the vaccine. Uh, 
I'll go, I'll go ahead and go first. The, you know, um, I did get kind of fatigued a, uh, a little bit more than normal as an OBGYN delivering kids, but uh, uh, but I did get a lot of body aches and things like that. But the but when they when they look at you know the, the side effects of getting the, these vaccines, uh, most patients will will get uh, either uh, uh, usually a soreness in the arm. Uh, that usually will go away within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, you may get uh, a headache, you may get some joint aches. Less commonly, will you get uh, a fever or, or more severe symptoms? And what everyone talks about is getting what they call anaphylaxis or, or a really incredibly severe reaction to the vaccine, but it's incredibly rare uh, uh, where, where it, it's depending on the vaccine, it's like two to five per million doses uh, of, of people getting the vaccine itself. I think about it another way. If, if there were tons and tons of people are having severe, severe reactions to the vaccine, we'd hear about it every day. It, it would just be constantly inundated on the news or on social media. Uh, so the vast majority of, of people have, have done well. And I, I can tell you from seeing almost 500 of our uh, of, of our of our Hunwe being vaccinated in our area, that, that I haven't seen any of those severe type side effects. Uh, maybe Dr. Horn or, or others can speak about their their own communities. So right now we, um, because I, I am working on the northern part of Alquazasne, so that's on the Canadian side in the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. And uh, we're just starting to roll out um, the vaccinations for the general uh, community members. Um, the people who work in the long-term care homes, our nurses, PSWs, kitchen staff, anybody who works there um, have uh, been vaccinated. And so there's been a, a slow rollout. Um, and so I haven't really encountered any people who um, in the community who have been vaccinated um, because um, we're still uh, on the way there. Um, but it's really good to have gone through the experience because now I can actually talk from first person um, and, understand, and really do tell them that it, it is quite, a, quite a, a marked reaction the second time. And just like what, um, what Brian, uh, Dr. Thompson um, said, it, it's quite a profound body ache, um, really bad headache and, um, and just exhaustion and arm, arm pain. Um, but that lasted about two days and then it was gone. And so, um, so I have a lot of confidence when I talk to uh, my patients about what they're gonna be um, expected to go through with a good response to this uh, vaccine. I'll just add one more thing. What, what, just from seeing literally thousands of, uh, there's about 10,000 people at where I work at, at Upstate and, and just seeing and hearing uh, uh, of all these thousands of, of healthcare providers and people. It, what, what's really odd about this vaccine is that, that once those symptoms go away, it's all of a sudden they're gone. Like if you, you know, if you had like uh, COVID or then you had the flu that kind of hangs around a little bit and you kind of like wax and wane and then you get better. But pretty consistently of talking to people who've had it and our own people have had it, all of a sudden it's gone. Like your symptoms are just gone and you're back to normal again. Uh, uh, and usually that is within about, give or take about 24, 48 hours. But most of the people that have had you know, some side effects, it's usually kind of like, a little bit delayed, you know, kind of like the next day or uh, 12 to 24 hours later is where you, you start to kind of develop some of those symptoms because your body's starting to ramp up that fight. You know, you're, you're fighting against the, you know, and, and mounting and, and, and getting that immune response, uh, which is what you want. Thank you um, for sharing. Dr. Gilson, have you had the vaccine? I have, yeah. I, um, uh, my partner is also in medicine. Um, I got the Moderna um, and, and he had the, the Pfizer vaccine. So it was kind of interesting to kind of compare. Um, 
But I think that the, what people are saying is that, yeah, I had some arm pain, um, headache, fatigue. Um, I, I felt otherwise okay. My partner had a little bit of a, like a low grade fever. Um, but I think kind of what Dr. Thompson was saying is that, yeah, it only lasts a day or so where we know like if you get COVID, um, you know, it can affect your lungs and you could have months of difficulty breathing um, versus just a day or two. And I have to say my dad's in his late seventies and he got his first dose of Pfizer this week. And I'm really grateful that um, he was able to get it as well. He actually had no symptoms. So. Yeah. So I actually haven't had my vaccine yet, so I can't really speak to um, any side effects that I would have, but um, I'll say that the review process and approval for these vaccines is incredibly strict. It's, I think the FDA is probably the most strict um, uh, group on the, on the planet for um, drugs that are approved for um, the country. And so if it was, since it makes it through their process, they have kind of determined that the benefits of a vaccine really far outweigh any um, side effects that people have kind of reported. So it's a, it's a pretty strict process for that. So it's, it kind of says a lot that it made it through, these two vaccines made it through the process. Yeah, that's great. Thank you all for sharing your experiences. So, um, so now we talked about side effects for the vaccine, but another, I think, really important question is, if you have already had COVID, should you still get the vaccine? So have you, are your antibodies or is your body's ability to fight this infection already there, or should you still go in and receive a vaccine? Um, so if anybody could speak to that. I'll go ahead and, and start it. If you, it's interesting. You would think, well, if I had COVID, then I don't need to worry about it. I'm good to go. And uh, uh, and and the the question is 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 we're not really sure how long. And I know there's tons of information. You know, everyone you know can go on social media on TV, and you know you become kind of you know your your own. You know your own self advocate, which is great, uh, but there there hasn't really been a, a specific. Hey, if I get COVID, I'm going to have protection for this period of time. It, it's this is a weird, it's a weird virus. Uh, you know, for anyone that, that has seen people have had it. You know, I I know people that shouldn't have gotten COVID through exposure that have gotten it, and people that should have got it who haven't. And people who are really sick with a ton of problems that do great with it, and people who really should do great with it don't. And you know, it's a weird virus, and 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 because of that, we also don't know exactly how long that immunity is if you do get it. So the the, the, the you know we think that it may be eight months, it may be a year, maybe years. Uh, we just really don't know. Uh, and for that reason, uh, the recommendation is that you should get vaccinated. So if you do want to get vaccinated after you've had COVID, uh, you should have no further symptoms. Uh, you should uh, be out of quarantine. And so if you don't have symptoms and you don't have quarantine anymore, then you can go ahead and get vaccinated. And the reason is, is that if you get vaccinated, then you're adding on that additional you know, fight in your body to have your protection last, last even longer. Yeah, and that's kind of the reason, the basis for when, for the Pfizer and Moderna and also for the AstraZeneca is they give you two doses. So with the first dose, you get some level of immune response. Um, I believe, I, I forget which vaccine it was, but like the first dose giving their measure of, of efficacy was about 50-ish percent. But then when you give the second dose, your immune system actually gets stronger against a, a virus if it sees it again. The more times it sees it, the stronger it can get. So that's why with two doses, the first dose gets you to about the 50 that they saw, but then the second dose gets you to that 95. So 
that's kind of the reason for two doses is the more your immune system can see a virus it actually remembers it better and can give um, a stronger response. Yeah, I think that that's, um, that's an important thing to recognize is that, you know, our body gets stronger, the more we're exposed to something too, in this case. So for our, the sake of our analogies that we were given, you know, our army gets stronger, um, we can fight this in a much better way, which I think is great. Um, so we kind of touched on this uh, with regards to protections. But I just wanted to move into if someone did receive the vaccine, are they fully protected? from COVID, um, should they continue to follow, you, you know, should they continue to follow the social distancing protocols and um, should they wear a mask? Cause you know, people, some people may think, hey, I got the vaccine and I can now walk outside without a mask or I'm never gonna get COVID. Um, so I think it's important to dispel any myths that might be around that. Um, so if anyone could speak to that, I'd be great. Yeah, so for this, I mean, you can still get mild symptoms from um, COVID, even if you have the vaccine. It, it doesn't, for all people, it doesn't necessarily protect against 100% of symptoms, but it can it has a very high um, protection against um, hospitalization and things like that, and more severe disease. But with the continue to wear a mask, so with this right now they are suggesting that you should still wear a mask even if you have been vaccinated because with the when they ran the clinical trials their main readout to get that 94 and 95 percent um, um, efficacy and protection was they were looking at um, symptoms and hospitalization and things like that so you can actually have an infection by this virus and not know it you could, you could have virus um, in your lungs and everything and not show symptoms that's called um, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infection, which is a large problem of why this virus has spread so rapidly in all around the world is that people can spread the virus without knowing that they even have it. Because I believe that the, they'll start spreading virus, I, I believe it's around 48 hours before they can show symptoms. So there's two full days of walking around um, without when you can spread the virus without knowing it. So one thing they're still figuring out and these, um, these studies are still ongoing right now is to, we know that the vaccines prevent severe disease, but now we're measuring, okay, if you have the vaccine, do you, does that prevent you from spreading the virus as well? So it could be that you completely stop spreading virus or the vaccine, um, only when you have the vaccine, you only spread a very, very small amount of virus. It's still there, but it might not be enough to get someone around you sick. So that's why right now they're suggesting to still wear a mask while um, the studies are ongoing and the scientists and physicians are trying to figure out the people who are vaccinated, okay, how much virus are they actually spreading if they are at all? And is that enough to get someone sick? So until we know that answer because these vaccines are really, the trials have been going on. Um, while they have shown, proven to be very good, the, um, they've only been really in trials under a year. So while those still, um, while they're still trying to ask, um, find the answer to that question of spread, they're still suggesting to wear a mask in, just in case. And then once they um, figure that out, then they'll um, let us know and then we'll figure out the masks. Yeah, so to the other panelists, you all have been vaccinated. So um, do you continue to wear masks like in your practice? Do you encourage you know, any patients that you have that have received the vaccine to continue to follow the protocols? I believe Dr. Thompson, you said that you did, um, but if any of you could speak to that and just kind of discuss, you know, you guys are post-vaccine. Um, so, you know, what are you still adhering to everything that's recommended? So I can speak to that. Um, you know, walking through the community and being all over the place like I am, um, I have a, a big responsibility to walk the walk. Um, and so if I'm vaccinated, I'm st I still have to protect everybody from the unknown. And right now there's a lot of unknowns. We don't know 
nearly as much as we will know a year from now or two years from now. And so things always change. And so we might as well do everything we can in our in, in our uh, armamentarium to be able to protect everyone. So yeah, that means I have to keep wearing a mask and I wear them in my clinic. I wear them to see everybody. Everybody's got them now. I got some really cool looking ones. People have become very uh, imaginative and very creative. And so uh, it's, it's a new thing and it's wonderful. Um, um, and so, yeah, I've, 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 it's, everybody's got them on, why stop? And if you stop wearing them, people will stop thinking that it's the norm and we might lose some of the uh, advances that we've made in trying to stop the spread of, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of this virus. Yeah, and I, um, I always continue to wear a mask and I actually, um, I am um, part of my, the people I, I take care of are um, living on the street or homeless. And I continue to wear a mask and I actually still wear a face shield. Um, I think because I, I want to keep um, the, pe the people in my community and the people I take care of safe, um, you know, cause I, we still, there's still a lot of questions that we don't know. And um, I wouldn't want to put people who might be at more at risk. Um, I wouldn't want to, to potentially give them COVID and, you know, being very strict, my um, uh, in-laws live only a couple hours away in upstate New York and, and they are vaccinated, but we haven't seen them yet just because we don't quite know, um, we don't quite know what's 100% safe yet. Um, so I under, it's frustrating and I know we all want to see our loved ones and, and hug them, um, but I think we want, you know, our younger generations, they are so strong and they have so much fire, but they need their elders around and, and they need to, you know, so I think it's, it's really important to uh, think about our communities. Yeah, thank you very much. That's great to hear. And I appreciate that insight. And I think, um, you know, another important group that we haven't discussed, and I understand the we're still learning information about this group is, um, pregnant women of our communities. So whether or not, you know, uh, can a woman receive the vaccine? If she is pregnant, if she's planning to become pregnant, um, what are the possible side effects for someone who's pregnant? Are they different? Um, and then if she was to receive the vaccine while pregnant, you know, will the baby be protected against COVID? And I understand we may not have all the answers to these questions, but I know we have, you know, some wonderful knowledge on this panel. So you guys could just speak to you know what you do know um, and what we still have yet to, to understand. Um, that would be, be great. Uh, we'll go ahead and I go ahead and start that. It you know it's a it's, it's a discussion that I have every day, uh, multiple times a day right now, and you know and, and I think it gets back to uh, you know is is first and foremost is kind of educating yourself a little bit, but also, you know, also hearing it from, from your, from your healthcare provider, but, but also, you know, kind of doing your own, your own investigative work also. Um, can a pregnant woman uh, receive the vaccine or if she's pregnant? Absolutely. Um, where I'm at is a, is a high risk labor and delivery unit. Uh, we take patients from, from the, from uh, Pennsylvania up to Canada and halfway to Rochester and halfway to Albany, really a big area of central New York. And, and I've seen some really devastating effects of, of people who get COVID in pregnancy. Uh, pregnant patients are, uh, who get COVID actually can get it worse. So uh, if, if, you, if you know that and, and you believe that through the through through what, uh, the science and how the vaccine works is that you're you're not gonna it's not gonna affect your genetic material it's not going to uh, go in and change your 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 DNA or your your, your body or anything like that uh, then at this point in time uh, we we don't have any knowledge that that it'll that it'll it'll hurt a baby or that it'll, it'll hurt the mom and that also goes for breastfeeding too uh, i think i had touched really quickly that 
that that part of that vaccine is broken down only in a couple of three hours, uh, and uh, it hasn't been found uh, to to uh, affect a, a mom if, if she's breastfeeding. Um, so uh, the medical organizations uh, of all the OBGYNs uh, here in the states and and uh, have have and the high risk OB doctors have, have felt that, that it is okay and safe to, to get vaccinated and, and encourage to get vaccinated when you're pregnant. Uh, and different organizations like the pediatric people and the baby doctors and American Academy of Breastfeeding have all said it's okay to go ahead and breastfeed uh, when, you're, when you've been vaccinated itself. There's research that's coming out every day uh, there's some thought that if you get vaccinated, uh, uh, that um, uh, in the breastfeeding, that there are some of those antibodies, not the, not the, the, the vaccine, but, but the result, the, the fighting part in your body, the, the antibodies uh, may actually kind of pass over a little bit, uh, be found in the breast milk itself, uh, and also be found in the baby. So. You know, there are other vaccines that we give when you're pregnant, flu vaccine or, or uh, pertussis for whooping cough. And the idea is, is not only protect the mom, but it's also to kind of protect the baby itself. Uh, you know, it's too early right now to tell, you know, all of those things, you know, if I, if I, if I get vaccinated when am I pregnant, am I going to protect my baby or, and all those things. I mean, there's, there's studies that are, are in progress, uh, uh, but the original uh, work on the vaccines did not include pregnant patients. But all, all the patients who've gotten pregnant, who have who have gotten vaccinated, there haven't been any issues with the vaccine itself. So the bottom line is, if you're pregnant, you're thinking of getting pregnant, uh, or you're breastfeeding, uh, the recommendation is go ahead and get vaccinated. Great, thank you. I really, I think we really appreciate that information. Um, so I just want to touch briefly on the uh, new, we're cutting close to time. So I just wanted to touch briefly on a couple more questions. And I think one of the important ones, because we've talked about the vaccine, we've created this vaccine for this current virus that we're trying to fight. Um, but now there's concern because the virus itself is changing. So our enemy is changing what it looks like essentially um, to trick our body and to you know cause this infection. So I just wanted to um, you know get your insights into you know if you all have seen this different these different variants um, versions of the virus in the clinic. Um, we do have a slide that was provided by Dr. Mertens kind of explaining. Um, broadly um, uh, the background behind the more of a basic science background, but then also I'd like to hear from the other panelists just about um, if they've experienced any other variants in the clinic as well. All right, uh, also I can explain what a, what a variant is. So um, variants of a virus are viruses that contain mutations in their genetic code because um, each virus has its own genetic code. And these mutations occur um, naturally from prolonged um, replication or prolonged spread among a population like this one has, since it has pandemic status all around the world and has affected millions of people. Um, so mutations in the genetic code are um, changes that are, they're essentially random. And most mutations actually have no effect on the virus or are actually lethal to the virus because they are random. Um, however, some mutations can make viruses more transmissible between people and then can cause them to spread more rapidly. So there are three main variants that um, are circulating of this COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2. So they're calling them um, the UK variant, the South African variant, and also the Brazil variant. 
Um, so what we see now is they appear to spread more rapidly than the original virus. That's what they're comparing it to, the one that emerged from China. The studies of that are still ongoing, but that seems to be kind of the consensus right now, or the, they're a little hesitant about it. But, um, but I think the more important thing is that it's currently unknown whether or not they cause more serious disease or get or cause you to get more sick than the original virus for, that was that emerged from China. So um, the two vaccines that have been approved, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, they appear to give some protection against these variants. But um, since these variants are relatively new, the studies are ongoing to see exactly how protective um, these two vaccines are and how they can improve the vaccines to also give protection against these variants. And actually one major benefit of these um, mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna is that that chemical message with their technology, they can actually change it very rapidly and then move that into um, trials and testing for these variants very rapidly. Can I um, just, uh, I just wanted to uh, say something um, about, um, about this whole uh, pandemic, this whole um, emergence of this infection. Um, you know, all of our people have, um, have their own creation stories. We have our own um, stories that we, you know, um, that have been passed down through generations. And one of them in our, um, where I am from, and we talk about um, how things that were not compatible with, uh, with health, with, with uh, happy, happiness, things that were really dangerous um, for our people were placed in places very far away from us. And they were hidden, you know, deep in the rock or deep in the ice or, you know, deep in a, in a forest or in a cave, or they were just put far away so that we would not um, become close to them. And there were natural buffers there that would keep us, you know, away from these things. But over the last um, the last um, century, we have slowly taken away all of the buffers that have kept us apart from these dangerous things. And so it's in and so I've always um, been told that there was going to become a point when these buffers would no longer be able to protect us and that we would get sick. These things would be able to come out and be able to once again make us sick. And that's something that I knew as a child. So I always as I became I went through medicine, um, well, all the stuff that came before medicine, and then eventually medicine, I always, you know, kept another ear open looking for these things that were hidden away that would one day come out. And so if this is not something that our people, um, especially if we have these stories, um, it's not something that we don't understand. It's something that we've kind of expected. These variants, um, we know about these, but there's a lot of other things that are, are out there that, um, that we have um, become exposed to that we may not know about. And so, you know, just keeping our, um, our bodies healthier, our environments healthy, starting to participate in the earth and, and love her again and protect her. These are all the things that our people know how to do. It's in our collective memory, how to take care of the earth so that we can one once again, reinforce all these buffers that have slowly eroded. And, um, and that's why the indigenous voice is very important in this whole discussion, not just about COVID, because it's very much related to the changes that we're noticing in our earth. And so, um, and so I just wanted to step back and look at the bigger picture of where COVID is and how we look at it in our communities and that this is not a big surprise. And I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, just to kind of take it in even a different way, we knew that we knew that this was going to come, and it isn't going to. It isn't the first, and it isn't the last. Uh, and but, but, you know, what what's incredible is is that, uh, you know. The, the, resilience and the strength within our communities. Uh, all the differences have been put aside a little bit and, and we start to come together as one. 
of a good mind and work as one. And, and that's an incredible thing to see, something that I'm glad to see um, uh, and my kids to see. And, you know, and, and different things that you've never appreciated before. You know, when, when somebody will say, you know, uh, what do you remember about, about this whole time period? But one of the things that I remember the most when it was really bad, uh, like it was in New York City at that time, and I'm trying to forget now, maybe March or April of last year or so, uh, you know, kind of in that time frame, I could walk outside and I didn't hear any planes in the sky. And, I, and if I went down the road, there were no cars and it was so peaceful and quiet and the air smelled like I, and tasted like I'd never smelt and tasted it. I can remember it was so clean and, uh, you know, and it, and it goes back to how, how important uh, uh, our environment is and how everything around us is alive uh, and, uh, and will heal itself and rejuvenate itself and how important our, our, our people are to all of those things. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, there, there, there are you know, bad things about this time, but, but there are good things too, and not to diminish, diminish it in any type of way at all. Uh, but there, there are lessons, I think, that our, our communities will learn for a long, long time to come. No, I think that that's incredibly important to keep in mind, and it's, you know, phenomenal that we've had these stories within our communities and we've, you know, we just, we knew this was coming <laughs> at some point, um, unfortunately. Uh, so I know we're getting close to time. I just wanted to ask a few um, community submitted questions. Um, and so, so one of them would, we've talked, we talked about pregnant women, we've talked about, you know, our elders, but I wanted to talk about members of our community who have, um, HIV and AIDS, you know, can they still receive the vaccine? Should they still receive the vaccine? Um, possible implications, should they choose to receive the vaccine? Um, if anybody could speak to that. I think um, the vaccine, um, um, I know that there are people who have diabetes. So it's not just HIV and AIDS, but anybody who is immunosuppressed with a number of um, um, illnesses, which would include HIV, AIDS, diabetes, and stage renal disease, um, lots of autoimmune diseases that we have in our communities. Some people are on some really strong medications to suppress their immune system. And in those cases, those people may not be able to mount an immune response effectively um, when they're given the vaccine. As far as if they can get it, I actually don't know. But I think that it means that the people who are around those people really need to think about protecting them by getting themselves vaccinated. That's great, thank you. Um, and then another question it was about uh, children. So they're asking, how do we protect vulnerable children when all the adults and elders in the home are vaccinated? Children who can't go to school because the threat is still too great until it's approved for them to be able to receive the vaccine. Well, I think it's the same thing that I just said about anybody who is immunocompromised, um, but we don't really have as much of a robust idea of how children are affected from what I understand. Uh, children may, may be asymptomatic and, uh, and carry it back home. So if you have a family that everybody is vaccinated, that's wonderful, especially if the child um, you know, is young and healthy, then uh, they probably, if they brought it back, I mean, we should all continue to practice all of the things that we've learned over the past year. Um, our, our distancing from um, people who are in other bubbles um, and continuing to wash our hands and wear masks. But as far as, you know, coming back into the home, um, I really think that our children should be in school. The amount of mental health 
um, the amount of, um, of problems socially that have come up and have emerged because of the isolation, um, the um, problems with domestic violence, the problems with just the, the stress of having to live in enclosed quarters with no routine or plan of action or poverty, um, you know, is creating a lot of um, a lot of, um, of, of problems. And so to be able to go back to a routine, which includes kids in school, I think is really Really important and, and so if the family is vaccinated I um, I would say that there's a quite a good argument to have the child to go to school because of all of the benefits from school that they will um, that they will um, that they will be able to uh, to uh, garnish from that and you know I, and I, I completely agree and, and also too our kids need to be in ceremony you know, our kids need to be uh, with, with, with their friends uh, and uh, experience uh, uh, all of that. Uh, uh, you know, I can't wait. Uh, and uh, I know there's a lot of kids out there that are just, you know, you know, waiting to do it. And, uh, but uh, it'll come in time and uh, uh, it'll, be a, it'll be an awesome time. No, that's that's great. I, yeah, I know we're all excited whenever we can get out and hug our family again. Um, so I, one thing that you touched on, Dr. Horn, was the mental health toll that you know this pandemic and has taken on everyone, and especially our communities. So um, I just wanted to see if someone could speak to you know ways that you guys have stayed grounded yourselves during this very difficult time. You know, in your roles as physicians, as researchers, um, you know, realizing what's happening in your own communities, things that you have done, things that, you know, ways you've still maintained that connection, um, even during this difficult time. Um, what Brian um, has said is, is really important. It's about ceremony. We have long houses where I am, and they've been pretty much empty of the community people. We still have people who, um, faith keepers and chiefs who, and you know, clan mothers and important people who go into our, our houses and do the important ceremonies because we do need to have them done regularly. But for the, for the people um, who, um, who don't go to these ceremonies because we can't because of social distancing, um, we do them at home. And so being able to do ceremony at home has become um, something that a lot of people have, uh, have gone to, bringing all of those ceremonies back back into where it used to be which is with the family so um, um so that's what we've done um but also i've spent a lot more time just walking and i would like to say um, in a very lucky position that i can now read the stars which is something i never took time to be able to do but now i can look at the constellations and figure out you know um you know um the just different points that are of interest. And it's just really nice to have the time and to actually look and do something that I would have never have done had I not made myself go out and do something to relieve my mind of all of the problems that um, happened because of COVID. Um, picking up a new hobby um, and of course ceremony, those are two things that I've done. Uh, I, it's funny that you said that it, it, it's what uh, there was a clear night down here at, in Syracuse, I, I don't know, maybe five days, seven days ago. I can't quite remember now, maybe a little bit longer. It's crystal clear outside. And I've been just waiting for that crystal clear night uh, right around this time period. And, and to take the boys, I have three boys, my, my wife, three boys, to take them outside and, and, and show them uh, the stars. And so we, we showed them you know, we took them out and showed them, you know, Orion and then next to it uh, is Taurus. And then right next to that uh, is the seven dancers that they call Pallades. And, 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 and to teach those, they're 15, 12 and 10 and say, it's overhead, it's straight overhead right now. And what does that mean? And don't ever forget that. Teach your brothers if they forget. And then when you get older, teach other people and teach your kids and teach their kids. 
And that's how we pass on our stuff. I just wanted to um, end by saying that, um, you know, we all come from different communities, from different people. Um, indigenous people, we are incredibly resilient. We're here after an incredible amount of, of effort to try and make sure that we weren't here anymore. We're still here. And, um, and, and the way that we're going to continue forward is by bringing all of our minds and all of our experiences together with the intention of looking forward so that we can have a place for our children to live, you know, seven generations, you know, in front of us, that there's still going to be um, the earth here to be able to have them live productive, very wonderful lives. Um, and so we need everybody all, you know, it's so wonderful to, to meet you, Dr. Mertens, because, you know, you're a virologist you know, you have that knowledge. We have people all over Turtle Island who have all of these different types of knowledge. And if we can just bring all of our minds together, we can get through this incredible time. Thank you. Yeah, that's very well said. Thank you. I, yeah, I appreciate that insight. And this was kind of leading into my final thoughts. So um, I know Dr. Gilson, Dr. Burtons, you haven't you could just share, you know, any final thoughts that you guys have as well. Dr. Thompson and Dr. Horn, feel free to add. Um, I would just chime in by saying I uh, myself during this time am trying to learn Cherokee and learn more about my culture, um, you know, and they, I have this time and, you know, I really want to honor that part of me. Um, so I'm definitely trying to take that time and reconnect with uh, my family and teach my family and, um, get back into beating and uh, a lot of things like that that I think have been helping me during this time. Um, so I'll pass it over to you guys. Yeah, yeah, I think um, kind of echoing what everyone has already said, I think the the um, the future is indigenous and the more that we can work together and kind of pool our resources, I think it's um, it's been really, um, exciting to be a part of. And I think one thing that I've been doing during the pandemic is connecting with some of the, um, some of the tr fr frontline tribal, um, workers and, um, helping them kind of help other people. Um, and then also for me, similar, I've been, um, picking up some Dakota language and then, uh, I run every day, no matter what the weather is. Um, for me, it's really spiritual and it's a way for me to, you know, I, I don't have my phone or headphones and really just connect with the land around me. And just to be reminded that, um, you know, I am such a small part and such a bigger, bigger system. Um, and so, and being a part of, uh, mother earth on turtle Island is, um, you know, I just remind myself that I'm thankful to be here every day. I think, um, a lot of this is definitely probably the, the two most important things you can do right now are take care of yourself and take care of others because without uh, everyone together like the, the group can be the most times stronger than any of the individuals so it's important to take care of everyone um through for me throughout this pandemic i think one thing that um kind of gave to me was it kind of made me kind of stop for a little bit because it's very easy to get caught up in everything that's going on in the world. If you're um, paying attention to all the stuff that's happening in the world or social media or things like that, you can kind of get um, so engaged with that that you kind of sometimes forget to just take a minute. And then um, for me, I think the biggest example was that since um, I was in uh, Boston, I, I'm in Utah now, but I was in Boston for a lot of the pandemic last year. And usually Boston is like New York. It's so loud. There's people um, walking, yelling at each other, you know, honking their horns and everything. But um, yeah, the city kind of shut down because of the pandemic. And I, I distinctly remember, so I'll be sitting, um, like sitting in my apartment and I have my windows open and since it's that quiet, you can now you can hear the like the crickets that you can't before because they were always drowned out by all of the the because I live next to a busy street, so you hear all the cars, but everyone kind of kind of quieted down, and that was kind of a 
um, while a literal example, also a metaphorical example of that it kind of um, taught me to sometimes you just kind of have to just stop and um, take in everything. So I guess that's kind of one of the, the silver linings of all of this. No, that's that's great. Thank, thank you to each of you for sharing. And um, we just want to close with any last yeah. final piece of um, advice that you have for the community. Um, just any last minute thoughts that you have to share. I just wanted to say one thing real quick is thank you to American Indian Community House for, for sponsoring this and the work that you do down in New York City. And for all that don't know, I know everyone in New York City knows, the largest urban population of Native Americans is in New York City. And the advocacy never stops. Uh, and all of that never stops of pushing forward healthcare for people in New York City. So my question is that I have is United States, Indian Health Service, New York State, why isn't there a native healthcare facility that provides direct native healthcare in New York City? That's crazy when you have the population in New York City of natives that is more than Phoenix and Los Angeles combined and you don't even have a direct healthcare facility. And look at the effects that happen in, in terms of what's going on right now. There should be a healthcare facility in New York City. That's my final thought. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanna say thank you for affording me the opportunity to be here today. I, I really enjoyed this and I hope we kind of um, un untangled a lot of the tangled information out there about this virus and the vaccines and everything. And I guess my little piece of advice is if you get the first shot, get the second one. <laughs> it gives you, make sure you get that full 94 or 95. Don't just get the first one. Be sure to get the second one as well. Good pieces of advice. <laughs> Dr. Horner, Dr. Gilson. I just wanted to, um, to say that um, you end up, uh, when you live in a community um, and don't leave, uh, you, um, you start to think that, you know, you're the, you're by yourself. Um, and, um, and I know that back and forth between the communities and urban centers is um, something that's quite um, like what um, you were saying. Um, it's, um, there's a lot of urbanization, a lot of indigenous people in our cities, in Canada, um, um, in Toronto, in Montreal, Ottawa, just across the board. And it's true, we do, we do, um, we, we tend to forget that we have so many connections to uh, between the communities and, um, and, uh, and between the two communities, the urban and, um, and the, um, and the res and the, and the reserves, the community reserve, the communities, urban and reserve. And I just, um, I think we have to be cognizant of that because really, like I said before, we can get through this if we put all of our minds together. And, you know, I think this zoom thing has been fantastic because it's been able to bring exactly what we're doing today, all of these minds together to talk about this really important issue. And I just uh, really thank um, you for doing this today. I am um, really happy to uh, be part of it and to meet some new people. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm just want to thankful for having me and thankful for the work that you all are doing. Um, Bravenedo. Uh well, Dola, thank you to all of you for um, attending this evening. And I really appreciate the privilege of getting to meet all of you. And I appreciate you uh, working with me to put this together and providing this resource to our community. Um, I know it's one that's desperately needed. And I know there are many people watching who greatly appreciate, you know, hearing from physicians and researchers who look like them um, and who understand where they come from. I think that that's really important as well. Um, and we're going to end our live stream, but I would ask that our panelists remain on uh, for a few more minutes. And thank you again to all of the community for joining.